Hello, everybody. I'm Joey Ito, and I'm here with Evan Chen, uh, co-founder and CEO of Miston Labs. I'll ask you to give a little bit more of your own background, but I know Evan because he was, I think you did the back end for LLVM, which most otaku in open source know, but it was a very important sort of milestone, both in open source as well in understanding um, programming languages. And I think what Evan and his team initially did at Facebook and then spun out with Miston Labs is, to me, taking you know very high quality sort of Silicon Valley big tech firm level computer science and programming language energy and putting it into the blockchain and there's some great things about the way the blockchain has emerged sort of bottom up but I think this pivot of sort of Silicon Valley big shots getting into blockchain is is kind of a milestone and so we're here to hear from Evan just on the dawn of the testnet launch of um, uh, Miston Labs so we, uh, to hear a little bit about uh, his views on blockchains and also on where uh, Sui is going. So Evan, maybe, I don't know if you want to give more background and then start your conversation. Uh, yes, yeah, first of all, th thank you for having me here. It's uh, good morning uh, to everyone here. Oh, and one, one thing, yeah. we're taking questions at the end, so put them either in the chat or prepare some questions. But. Yeah, uh, good morning, uh, Tokyo. Uh, it's it's great to be back in Tokyo after almost three years. Uh, you know, it's funny, the, the we, we named the blockchain after a Japanese word, Sui water, right? It's meant to be boundless, uh, meant to be, you know, shaped into anything, right? So that's also related to the, the presentation I'm about to give, right? We, we take a very, very different view on how this blockchain or Web3 is going to, you know, take shape uh, in the coming years. Uh, a little bit about myself, right? I've been, you know, technology uh, companies for about 26 years, um, you know, done a lot of things, including LVN, um, you know, always being a bit of a maverick, always want to take a contrarian view, always very focused on doing what I believe is right. So this is great to have opportunity to share with the world our vision and what we think about uh, how this um, kind of this new field is going to evolve in the coming years. So I'm just going to jump right into it. As uh, Joey say, this is experiment. This is also experiment for me. I literally uh, finished this presentation a few days before my trip and never rehearsed. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's the way I always find, you know, uh, th the most energy is just, you know, speak my mind and, and talk about what's on my mind. Um, and you're going to get a f view of that, a sense of that from this presentation. It's a very different uh, kind of way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, so, you know, I'm just going to get started. So uh, the first thing we sh need to do is to define what Web3 is. Uh, but before we can define what Web3 is, well, let's talk about what's wrong with the internet today, right? Uh, why do we need to change the way we build products? Uh, what's wrong with the web today? Well, the thing that everybody's talking about is this centralization that's happening on the internet, right? In the old, old days, internet is about facilitating this peer-to-peer -peer relationship, right? Have a more efficient market, so to speak. Um, but that quickly changed back, right? As as the down, you know, ev evolution of Web two happens, the user-generated content become controlled by centralized centralized entity, who you know provide a service. Uh, let's get, don't, you know, I'm not a maximalist or anything. Uh, these platforms provide essential service, but well, company want to make money. So they continue, you know, they, they become the distribution and monetization control. Uh, so that changes how the internet, you know, is, you know, kind of move away from what people want it to be. Uh, so example, right, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, uh, you know, the, the the creators right they get a cut of the monetization rather than the other way around right so the the advertising dollars goes to the platform uh, they control how they distribute the content they control what's good what's wrong what's bad you know you know the creator don't really have that much of a say uh, you know social media is another example of this right your social graph right your connection Right. Every time you sign on to a new platform like Twitter or whatever, you import your contact. Right. You re-import the limit of what your, your your social graph, even though that is the product. Right. That's the basis of the engagement. You can't take the social graph out of a centralized entity and use it to your own benefit. Right. That's another example of assets that you produced, but you don't have control over. You know, even in games, right? Fortnite, World Warcraft. You've seen this happen, right? You you, you put efforts into it, you, you spend hours in it, 
but the asset only have value in that private box, right? Uh, you can't really take it outside. So what would look like, Web3 is not a new web, right? It's not a, it's not a new internet. It's also not a magic money printing machine, seems like a lot of people believing it to be. It's just not about all these DeFi stuff, NFT, you know, collectibles or DAOs, right? Those are components, uh, example, what you can do with it. It's the essence of it is really about the relationship between the producer, the consumer, and the platform and the product, right? It's about having more of a uh, sort of, you know, rather than sort of, it's coordination between the people and the platform, right? Because if you have some ownership in the product, in the platform, you have more control in your assets, some of the power move back to the people. Right, it's not black and white. It's not like 100%. We don't want platform. It's not 100%. You know, only the platform control. Right, it's a subtle shift. This is about how product is going to change over, over, you know, the next few years. Right, which is already happening, with or without a blockchain, with with without a, a cryptocurrency. Uh, right, so content platform. Right, you can think about platform become more facilitator, become more marketplace, but bring the two sides together, right? If I am a creator, I still have control of my asset and the monetization happen directly between, you know, you consuming this content and me as a creator. That's good, right? That, that's a shift. Uh, you, social network, I want to take my graph, you know, social graph outside Twitter, right? If, if I can have that, that's powerful. Uh, so, so Twitter, if Twitter goes away or become controlled by one person, which may happen <laughs> coming up, right? When we're talking about this, uh, you know, all those of us are, are care about the, the impact of a social network like a Twitter is concerned about this, right? Somebody control, have absolute control of the platform. We want to have a counter to it. Even in gaming, right? Gaming is not just gaming today, right? Fortnite is not just a game. It's very much has social elements, right? My buddies and I are joining, playing the game together. That is powerful. That's important. I want to not be sort of leveraged, monetized, right? That relationship should, I should benefit from it. So these are the shift, right? That is the essence of Web3, as, as, at least when we think about it. It's not this crazy stuff you're thinking. It's this how we build product in a way and how us as human interact with these platform as products. So that's the essence of Web3. And what it will look like? Well, it's not gonna what it look like today. Today, it's in your face. If you're interacting with a crypto or Web3 product, you know it, right? My mom is never gonna use a wallet. It's never want to pay for gas, right? It's not gonna click on MetaMask. That, that is never gonna be mainstream. Web3 is going to be successful when people don't know that's happening, right? It is just in the background, you know, they, they have a greater sense of this connection with other users on the platform. That's, that's improvement or uh, because they have a, a bit of ownership in the platform, they feel more connected, they feel, care more about it. Uh, even in a game, right? If I have know the assets I own or created in the game is gonna have some meaning uh, even when I'm finished with it. Even two years later, a new version of the game or new iteration, the next one in the, se in the series come out, I may be able to take the asset I already have some, some, I already put some hours in, some money in. If I can take that and into the next game, I feel more loyal to, to this, right? So it's that kind of, subtle changes. Um, so, so that's, that's what's about, right? I, you know, in gaming, right? If, if we all together and, and, and take on a boss, right? And, and that should be captured as a moment, right? Think about right now, a lot of these use cases, so pseudomorphic. If it changes a little bit uh, to, to say, you know, that moment has meaning to me and my friends, and, and that would be great, right? That's what we are looking for. Uh, user generated content not solely controlled by the platform. So now with that sort of bit of a background established what Web3 is about, 
let's talk about one important component that's the blockchain. Uh, so blockchain is really, you know, the essence of the blockchain is not a new concept. It's called a replicated state machine. Uh, so states, right, if you think about something, a digital asset has states, right? This is what describe what the asset is, right? You think about it right now, if you are familiar with cryptocurrency, you say I have a 10 Ethereum, that is a state, right? That number 10 is a state. That's what represents the asset. Uh, so replicated state machine just basically have this distributed system concept that's being around for many, many years, right? That makes sure there's a replication, uh, not control, you know, for, for the sake of redundancy, for uh, so, so one no false goes away, you still have this out there, right? So the applying this to the blockchain, right? You have the validators agreeing on a state and some function that, that takes this state to the next iteration. Uh, that, that's what the essence of blockchain. What's different now is blockchain is even more distributed, replicated uh, over a lot of, lot of different nodes. So this level sort of replication make it useful as the authenticated repository of digital assets that actually have value. And because there's value, you don't want to trust a rotary you know, centralized entity. You, don't, you want to distribute the trust. That, that's how you should think about it. I'm not trusting one person. I'm not trusting one company. I'm trusting a lot of different entities and there's this kind of shared ownership in the underlying, you know, infrastructure. So they sort of like kind of become a balance of power, right? You, you don't worry about, you know, somebody, a bad actor taking it down. So, so that, that's essentially the, the most important element of this. And the other element that's unique, it's very powerful, is the programmability. So if you can write a program that on your behalf or on anybody's behalf, react to events, react to some transaction uh, that's trying to manipulate your asset, you know, think about it, right? Now you can say move even further away from a centralized entity. You can replace them with programs that you can trust. So, so that's, that's basically it. At the essence, right, if you want to think about what a blockchain is, it's just an infrastructure, right? It's a programmable, shared, and open and authenticated database, right? So that's from a developer standpoint. Right now, I'm already trusting, you know, Amazon, AWS, Google Cloud, any of these kind of cloud service provider providing me with some database service. Or I, I run some, my own data center. I have a database storing my assets in this private space, trusting one entity, what if I can remove that to trusting this shared open database, right? So, so that's what we want to establish, right? That, that makes sort of the mental model for developer, from the, especially from the developer point of view, you know, very easy, right? That's the transition, right? That's how I can start thinking about, do I want to let go of some control? Do I want to establish this kind of different relationship with my customers? Who use my products, so 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 that's the background. Um, so, with that background established, we want to start talking about where we are today. You know, does it live up to the hype? Does it live up to the promises? Does it fulfill these core functionalities? Does it do a good job of modeling asset, creating this asset, and ownership record keeping? Does it do a good job of that? Does it provide good programming experience for developer to say, I can write a program, allow this program to manipulate this asset. And finally, can I, at any point in time, you know, the system going to be capable enough processing all these transactions coming from all these applications and users? You know, can it do that? So these are the three core functionality of blockchains that is the foundation of Web3. Uh, and there are a lot of them out there, right? So everybody's taking a different view, point of view. And let's talk about it, let's look at it, right? Let's fo focus first on assets and ownership. Okay, so 
everybody probably here, if you're listening to this, you care about blockchain, you care about Web3, you know about the OG blockchain, that's Ethereum. Obviously, there's Bitcoin before that. Before Bitcoin is less programmable. It's programmable, but people don't think about it. Ethereum is really the, the, the OG blockchain uh, for what's happening in Web3 today and still the dominant one. Um, and let's look at it today. So what happens today? Uh, let's say I define a new asset class called Token X. I'm not very imaginative with name, right? Let's say I have a new token, to token X. I write a smart contract to control every aspect of it, minting the token, transfer the tokens, and so on and so forth. Um, today, the data model of Ethereum is a little wonky, right? If I am Alice, I have a account established on Ethereum. I buy one token X. So what's happening? Well, so I execute this, you know, send a transaction to the smart contract. Say I'm buying one token and that's tracked. So where is the tracking? The, tr the state is actually inside the smart contract, right? So the smart contract internally has a map to say, Alice has just purchased one token. Let's update it, okay? So, so it's inside the smart contract. That there's something really, if you think about it, there's already something that's a little wonky. Remember, this is supposed to be my asset, but the only thing that represents my asset is inside the smart contract that has a map to say, this address now has one token. Okay, so, well, let's say now my friend Bob comes along, you know, say, hey, I really into this uh, token X thing. You already have one, just give it to me because you don't care about it anymore. I say, yeah, fine. Let me issue a transaction to say, please transfer my asset, my one token, to Bob. Okay, issue the transaction, what happens next? Well, initially, in, inside the smart contract, execute these instructions, update the, the state to say, you know, now let's update, change the map to say, Bob now has one token, Alice doesn't have it, right? This is all happening inside the smart contract. All the states are captured there. So if you think about it, you say, okay, do I actually own anything? At any point in time, Bob or Alice own anything? My asset, I'm transferring my, handing my asset to someone else, but I have to basically talk to the centralized entity now. That's a smart contract of a token X and say, please, please update the, the you know, your internal map to, to reflect the change in ownership. Okay, imagine 10 million people doing this simultaneously, transferring my asset to someone else. All 10 million of them will be sending a transaction to the same smart contract and say, please update your internal map. This is, from a scalar point of view, is pretty bad, right? I am handing my asset to someone else they are handing their asset to someone else. There should be no relationship between these actions. But all of us are sending a transaction to one entity. The amount of conflict, the resource contention here is bad, even for things that's transferring asset. So this is the wrong data model, okay? You don't actually have access of your control. I mean, control of your asset, you don't have a way to say, I'm going to give away, I'm going to lend it temporarily to someone else. I cannot store in, you know, somewhere else. I cannot have another smart contract, you know, do something with my asset. I don't actually have control, right? I'm beholden. Everything is controlled by this one smart contract. So yes, it's, it's an improvement. Rather than trusting a, a person or company, I'm trusting a smart contract, but the smart contract acts still have overwhelming control of this, right? So it's a step for, forward, but you can sense there's something not quite right with this model. Well, let's talk about something that's a little bit more complicated, that's an NFT, right? I, I want some to be able to model an asset that's complicated more than a balance. I want to say uh, this asset have these different states can I do that? Well, so today the NFT 
everybody use like Bore Ape, you know, you know, Cyberpunk or whatever you know, uh, or, or NFT that reflect a uh, real world asset, all use this NFT s standard called ESC721. Again, the ownership information is a mapping, your token ID to owner address. The metadata you can keep is very simple. It's a name, it's a symbol, it's a URL. Why is a URL? Well, because you can't really actually store anything on chain for a variety of technical reasons. And the fact was just not designed for it, right? So it's, this has gotten even worse, right? So the asset actually lives off chain. In some, the URL points to it, um, right? That's the JSON blob that's stored off chain. So if you think about it, right, this is pretty terrible. Right. Not only did we establish previously the smart contract control my asset, I don't really have control over it. I don't have true ownership. Now this asset actually lives off the blockchain. Somebody else who wrote the smart contract can probably mess with my asset because it's stored somewhere else. Uh, this is what people hear about as rock pool, right? You show somebody a, a, a picture and say, this is an NFT, it's going to be worth more later on because blah, blah, blah. And later on, they say, eh, no, I'm just going to rip it out, you know, rip it off. Or somebody copy it and change it intentionally or unintentionally. You, this, this is even worse. And, and then even think about it, right? What's the whole point of this, right? I want a program to be able to operate on my asset rather than human. Well, the program doesn't know anything about your asset because your assets live elsewhere, right? When they look at your NFT, it's a URL. The programs, all the assets look exactly the same. What is the program going to do? It doesn't know the shapes or the current status or the state of the asset. So this is a pretty common problem. This is not unique to EVN, right? Other blockchains are trying to address this, do a little bit better job. But there are some fundamental problems, right? Assets are trapped inside smart contracts. Assets transfer themselves, create this contention. So it doesn't matter how hard you try. All these other effort you put on top of Ethereum layer twos and roll up, whatever, you, you fundamentally have this really, really bad design for everything are touching one very hot resource. And finally, the, the NFT just very static, right? This is why things are static. Uh, they, they represent ownership at best. You d they don't represent what's really important about the state, the asset, right? Think about if you wanted to use this for fine art, right? When you want to represent this fine art, you can't just say, I, I have an NFT that represents ownership. What's the history? What's your, what's the proof that you actually own it? Uh, you know, we talk to people in that business and say, well, every time you exhibit at a museum or change ownership, you need to capture all this information. Where do you put it? Right, so this is very static assets, very, very limited expressibility, safeness. These things are opaque. Um, you can't read the program against them. So there's a variety of merit of problems. Again, certain blockchains are addressing this. They're all making improvement. There's some aspects of this people understand it, but there's also a lot of people don't really understand this limitation. You know, this is probably the biggest problem uh, in the space today is people not really thinking about this type of problems, right? There's too much focus just on, hey, can I make things scale a little bit better? Can I solve this problem, right? There's too many single point, right? They're attacking a single point problems, right? I'm going to build a new project, a layer two, to just stress no other problem other than scalability. It doesn't really address this problem. And this is only one example of many, many problems. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to get across. Uh, when you think about, you got, when you think about building a technology that's so fundamental, you gotta think about what developer want to do, what sort of problem they want, they need to solve. You gotta think about what that consumer experience look like, 
and then you work backwards, right? You got to build the right kind of abstraction. You got to build the right kind of technology to support what they are trying to do. This is not it. Another example, you heard this word being talked about a lot, right? Just, just kind of double down, right? I mean, you, some people may say, well, stop kicking the, the dead horse, right? But, but I want to point out another one because this is one is driving me nuts, right? People talk about, oh, it's like Web3 is great. It's composability, composability. We can reuse the smart contract. That's true, right? Remember though, one smart contract control every aspect of a single asset. You can't even say smart contract A work with smart contract B, right? One asset that's controlled by smart contract, you cannot take it outside the boundary of the smart contract A and give it to a smart contract too. They, they, they really cannot work together, right? You, you cannot share asset across smart contract boundaries. When you do it, when people try to do it, they basically have to rewrite the same, the logic again, try to <coughs> reuse the code, right? You, Everybody who's a programmer understands just how complex, how error prone that is. Um, you can, there's just no, no good way to programmably do this, right? So today, you're not really seeing protocol level composability, right? There is these, a, a lot of different protocols, you know, working together to really transform and update an asset. That's bad. What about asset level composability, right? In the real world or in current Web2, I can say this asset and that asset, I can create new synthetic assets together. In a game, I can say I have a character. Now it's getting a magic sword, right? And all of a sudden, boom, it's a new, new kind of asset. Um, lots and lots of examples of these. There's definitely no asset composability in any of the other blockchains today. Uh, and without that, you're very, very limited, right? It's not possible for programmer to think ahead on the endless permutation of all these things interact with each other, right? If you think about metaverse, metaverse should be about creating a new world where people have lots and lots of different ideas, lots of different things. And you don't want to define ahead, of, it's impossible to define ahead of time how these interaction create new kind of result. So without a way to do this kind of generic composability asset, you're ultimately very limited. And if your infrastructure is limited, your product is going to be limited. And that's what we're seeing today. So now let's move on to the next core functionality that's programmability. So we already kind of touched upon this a little bit, right? You know, all these restrictions make programming against assets very, very difficult. And, and if you look at the essence, uh, something like uh, Solidity, it doesn't even have the first class concept what an asset is, right? It's just working with bytes. It's just like any other co programming language, right? So when you're thinking about a program, smart contract, it's about assets, it's about ownership, it's about access control, right? Can you define a new asset class? Can you rewrite and transfer the asset? Can you make sure the access control is, you know, what the program want is, the policy is, you know, being honored, right? So if you don't have these, you end up with a very, very bad programming experience. And that's what we have seen. Every few days there's being attacked, right? 20, 2022 is a new high water mark in, in, you know, attacks. Right, a lot of them of uh, because how limited the smart contract programming are. Reentrancy problems still a dominant uh, issue, still issue being explored left and right. I mean, I mean, this is because in this language they're just they're failing the basic responsibility of working with again this concept of access, right? Uh, all these things cannot be done in Solidity. Some other programming language are a little bit better, but they're very far from being able to do it right. Again, you cannot design a system piecemeal. If you design a system saying, I'm gonna have a ledger, I'm gonna solve this scalability problem, and then I'm gonna 
build another program language and layer on top of it, you're going to have a Frankenstein kind of system. So let's think about building uh, everything together, starting from the data model. So finally, uh, this is the one everybody's worried about, uh, everybody understand, everybody agree upon. That is, the blockchain today do a very, very bad job of processing transactions. They're very slow. Um, and when people talk about slow, they really talk about two things. They talk about scalability, right? How many transactions can it handle at a time? They're also talking about latency, how long for that result to come back? How long can I say, okay, the transaction is processed, I can use the new state for my future transactions. And why is that? Um, all the blockchain today look like this. It's basically, they have four different, basically, stages in trans process, uh, transaction processing. First, you get all these transactions, you verify them, you put them, you know, have initial checks to make sure the transactions are, you know, well formed, and you put them in mempool, uh, and then basically say, okay, here's a block of transaction, let's process them. The first step is consensus, that's sequencing or ordering all the transaction. So I, I can still remember the first time I thought about I heard about this architecture say there's something not quite right here. You're telling me there's like several hundred transactions in a block. Most of them probably have nothing to do with each other, right? I'm, I'm transferring my asset. Bob is transferring his asset. Alice is transferring their asset to someone else, right? You know, or I'm sending a transaction to this DEX or this other person sending a transaction to me in NFT. These things have nothing to do with each other, but somehow, the first step, well, in this case, second step in transaction processing is ordering all those transactions. There's something not quite right here, right? BFT consensus, when we're talking about maybe let's say 100 uh, validator need to come to agreement on the ordering of the transaction, that's, that's an end script. It's a math prevented from being very fast, right? Uh, you have all these validator across the world, sending message to each other. A few rounds later, they come to agreement before we can move on and processing and doing the execution and everything else. Something not quite right there. And then you have execution. You execute all these transactions and then you capture the result. But you have to wait for everything to be done before you can move on to the next step, right? So, so something is already establishing, right? Step step, step, at every step, you're waiting for everything to be done before you move on to the next stage, right? If anybody ever look at how microprocessors processing instruction, it's not like this. If you're waiting for everything to be done before you move on to the next stage, you're gonna be very, very, very slow, right? So right now, blockchain are built like this. Everything on the market today, including DN Core, right, which work has spent a lot of time working on at Facebook, including Ethereum 2.0, including Solana, Avalanche, you name it. They all look like this. Head of line blocking, waiting for everything to be done before moving on to the next stage. Right. So, and the last stage is after you execute all the transactions, you say this is all the result. You're writing all the result to a single global state. That's a Merkle tree. Most companies, most projects don't talk about this. This is actually a worse kind of database. You're writing a single, to a single global state. It's very, very slow. And it's very, very hard to parallelize updating a large tree-like data, data structure. So this is a, how it works across the board uh, for all the blockchain today. And we're gonna come back to this and compare how we can move away from this architecture to do something much, much smarter. And that's a good segue to uh, introduction to SWE. Uh, that's uh, what my company is doing. Um, it's a new kind of blockchain architecture. We'll say this first fully asset-centric uh, kind of blockchain, everything's built around this because each asset is just a typed object that's composable. Right, so the type part is very important. The object part is very important. 
what that means is everything your your boy ape uh, your cyber cyber pump your token X balance uh, a smart contract for minting NFT everything is just an object kind of similar to the, in the database world you have this object store kind of model okay so your global storage is just a mapping between the ID to the object so every object have global unique ID everything is just an NFT um, every transaction input output all expresses up as objects. So the key thing here is the transaction dependencies are explicit and statically long, right? So it's typed. Your program will write things very similar to your other programs in traditional programming language. Here's the input, these are your objects, and that's output, output as object, and you can pass the output to another program. So what's the benefit of this? Well, asset is a type of object. That means developer can actually, rather than fall back to a standard like ERC-721, that's very, very limiting expressibility, you can just define whatever type you want. Okay, in this example, it's a, you, know, you see there's a breed, there's like affinity, description, level, experience, so on and so forth, right? You can literally define that structure, that type you want your object to be, your asset to be. So now you can finally have a language to model anything you want. Um, and some of them, so fields can be mutable. There's no reason for them to be immutable. The record of the transactions are immutable for blockchains. The asset themselves don't have to be immutable. Uh, so objects now have sem consistent semantics across multiple contracts, right? I can literally say type def, some type, um, you know, a camera. Multiple smart contracts say, okay, I understand what a camera is. And I c they can work together. The data can be stored on chain and the property can be changed. Okay, this is what it should be in the first place. And now we can compose assets together, right? Literally, what we're seeing, this trivial example here, it just have two different objects and you nest one object into another, it's kind of hierarchical structure, very similar to real world, right? I have my inventory. My inventory is, and my phone is an object that's nested in me, right? That I own it. So that, that allow us to compose things together and that immediately change the parent object, right? You now have different properties. Compared to this, then say what the Bore Apes folks did as experiment, right? They have Bore Apes and have Siren, and they say, combine them together, create in the mutant boy, right? But they have to do this in a very, very kind of hacky way where they basically create a new NFT to reflect this. This is like mutation in place by composing things together. And then the next thing, right? Remember we talk about ownership, where you don't really have ownership in a EVM model because the record, the states, everything is trapped inside the smart contract. Okay, look at what happens now. Alex is buying a token X, okay, create it, and transfer the token back to Alice, okay. The object is owned by the actual account, which Alice controls. So when you want to do a transfer, you just transfer directly to Bob, right? I, when I transfer or do anything with my object, my asset, I don't have to talk to the smart contract, right? I'm handing it to you, you're handing something, to someone else, everybody handing the asset to someone else. There's no contention, right? So that eliminate a very, very fundamental bottleneck, uh, a performance problem, right? And now I actually have ownership of assets. Something as similar as, as simple as this, right? That solve a very, very fundamental problem in all the other blockchains today. And what's the power of this, right? It's the move programming language behind it, right? This is a you know, kind of platform agnostic smart, uh, smart contract language we designed back in, you know, at, at Facebook. Um, so this allow us to have all these nice properties, uh, uh, you know, because we have designed the language to have the proper linear type that allow us to make sure 
uh, things are done right. You know, a lot of the mistakes that you're seeing in other smart contract language are now defined away by construction, right? The language enforces things. So you don't have to worry about these things. The type system prevents misuse of asset values, right? So you cannot duplicate asset. The compiler, the system just tell you. You don't have to write the logic to make sure that doesn't happen. You don't have to worry about double spending because it's just defined away. You cannot, uh, you know, just like destroy your asset, right? The language, again, the compiler, or this, that will just let you know. So it's about having the language that lets you ensure the digital asset behaves like a physical one, right? The property of asset is a very, very different concept, and you have to pro properly define it. Okay, so now I talk about touch upon a few of the characteristic three, but the thing people always ask us is a fast, right? Again, when we talk about fast, it's about two things. One, it's about the super, the capacity. The other one is about speed. But is this really what developer really talking about? When we talk to developers, right, people build large scale applications, say, what is it you need? when you're thinking about using this infrastructure versus other? Do you think about number of transactions per second? No, they don't think about this. They are talking about two things. I say, I want to know how much it's gonna cost me. I need to know exactly, I don't, the cost. And also want to know if I keep on, you know, grow my business, you're not gonna come back and tell me and say, sorry, we ran out bandwidth, tough luck. Wait until next year, we have a great, scalability roadmap. Next year, I'm gonna double the scalability. Who cares about this, right? It's about at any point in time, I want to have these two things. So what that means is we want, they want elasticity, not just scalability. Having a scalability roadmap, having all these potential solutions doesn't help developers. They want to know near term, if I increase, can you increase the capacity to meet that spike? Right, remember what happened when the boy did a land sale. Ethereum's cost went through the roof, 100x or something. It's basically dead, right? Imagine if you build a business on Ethereum at that point in time. So like things are humming along and all that, and boom, they're doing a land sale. My cost just went on 100x. It's a noisy neighbor, right? The, your na noisy neighbor just like basically clog up the streets. I can't move my business forward anymore. I'm dead all the developer running the other direction when they hear about this. What about the Solana model? I'm just gonna keep the fee very, very, very low, regardless what happens. Well, guess what? You still have limited capacity in that given point in time, and your fee is constant, regardless how busy the network is. I am an attacker. I'm just gonna slam and keep on flooding you with, like, with spams until you run out of capacity. These solutions don't work, right? In the near term, you need to be able to handle these spikes. Think about how your favorite application work, TikTok, Instagram. Well, when something happens, they literally in the, in the data center just turn on more machines, right? The, the capacity increases to meet the high ingress. When the spike goes away, they turn them off, you know, figuratively speaking, right? You need to handle this. It's not just about scalability. It's about the ability to meet the demand when they need, when they come in. In the long term, yes, you keep on growing the capacity because your ecosystem growing. There's product always consume all the capacity. You're just gonna need to grow, grow, grow. If your system cannot grow, you're dead. So how do we do this, right? Remember, all the blockchains are processing one set of transactions at a time. And we talk about that doesn't really make sense because you say ordering all these transactions when most of them have nothing to do with each other, why couldn't they recognize that's not right? Well, because the modeling of the data is wrong and they're writing everything to a global state. In Sui, everything is an object. You know exactly which transactions are related to each other, right? If I have a DEX, 10, uh, in this case, six transactions are sending, I mean, six addresses sending transaction to the DEX. Okay, you know these six need to be ordered to each other because they're related. 
Same thing, I have a couple of people, you know, sending transaction to an NFT mint. Those are related, right? If I own my own coin belt, token X, I'm the only one that can mess with it because I'm the owner. Why do I need to worry about ordering with all the other transactions? Why do I need consensus in the first place? You don't need current trans transaction ordering. I know exactly the ordering. So by leveraging this new data model, everything is an object, every asset is an object. We know and everything is statically encoded and discovered. The system knows exactly how to segment, group the transactions into related groups. And every group can be processed in parallel without worrying about what other groups are being done. So this is the magic allow us to say validator for the sake of a simple mental model, if there's like 10 groups, you can have 10 workers work processing these 10 groups of transaction in parallel. If now we have a spike goes to 100 groups, well, let's get more machines over here, turn them on, now we can process 100 groups at the same time. Obviously, that's not how it works actually in reality, but that's a mental model. You increase resource, you scale your system on demand, right? If any system that doesn't kind of cannot do that, you fundamentally going to have limitations. And we know this is a, a very, very core infrastructure for the future. If your architecture doesn't allow you to scale by adding more resource, you don't have a system that will ever meet the demand of the world, right? Because the world is very, very big. So coming back to this, it's about the architecture. Right, this model we've been seeing for the last 10 years is just not going to work in the future. Right, and this is what we call horizontal scaling. By scale the system by adding capacity, by adding worker, by adding resource, and you have more uh, capacity. So let's come back a little bit, right? People might be like, at this point in time, it's like not quite get it, right? Let's use this analogy, sort of how you take transaction process and kind of like, how do you trans transport a group of people from one point to another? In the traditional classic blockchains architecture today, this is the four stages. This is like this group of, how many, uh, nine people going from point A to point B. Even though they actually want to go to a different location, our system set up only way, they all end up at the same point, right? That's analogies to, analogous to having this global state. That's your Merkle tree full of block, right? So they're all going to the same place. So they all go on the train and you all have to order, you know, everybody lined up, right? And you get, get on the bus or the train then execution could be checking your tickets, right? But you have to wait for everybody's ticket to be checked before your train takes off to the next stage. And finally, that everybody, you know, when you get there, right, then you can get off. But you have to wait for everybody to get off before your train go back to service more people. That's the bookkeeping stage. That's writing the states to the Merkle tree. And the different and Sui takes a completely different approach. It's a multi-lane approach, right? The people here are colored differently because they go to a different destination. They belong, th that's a transaction that handle a different, that targeting a different object. Okay, in this example, back here, right, there's three objects. So we have three groups of people colored differently. Um, and they, each of them just say, oh, I'm going to the red train, I'm going to the blue train, I'm going to this a lighter blue train, right? You go onto a different train. If you have 10 groups, you can bring more cars along, right? Or trains along. You can add resource at a point to process more of group of them in parallel. And this is sort of a, you know, we, we ran out of time today, so I'm not gonna talk about the, some of the deeper architecture design. The first group doesn't even need to go through bookkeeping. It's a much shorter stage. I mean, it uh, doesn't even need to go through consensus ordering because I own an asset, I know exactly how the transactions should be ordered, right? We do something completely different that cut out unnecessary consensus. 
Uh, so it's going to be super, super fast, right? So we have capacity wings. We also have latency wings. These kind of transactions are going to be going to finality way below a single se a second. Uh, for all the other st um, kind of transactions that's called shared objects, they also are much faster before because we don't need to do bookkeeping, right? Remember, for all the other blockchain, you write into a single Merkle tree. That's a bookkeeping. Here, er, the states are inside the object, right? My balance go from 10 to 20. That's a state change, immediately capture, finalize in the object. Com do we produce Merkle tree and blocks? Yes, but that's a bookkeeping that can be done separately outside the critical path of transaction processing. And this is also the magic that will allow us to uh, scale storage on chain as well. Okay, as opposed to all the other blockchain, they store everything in Merkle tree. Everything's Merkleized, so you're paying for replication as well as the data structure overhead. We don't have that concern. Some love to go into the the, the technical details another day, but uh, I'm just going to come to the conclusion. So, we're making an argument here. Hopefully, this is presented very clearly. You don't design the right system by attacking problems point to point separately. You got to think about the whole design consistently. And we're pointing out the data model and also related to how you program against these things are the fundamental problems with blockchain today. You got to have the concept of assets and assets need to be modeled as objects and type object. And this has tremendous value across the board from programming model to transaction processing, throughput, and speed, everything. Um, so, you know, hopefully this will give you a sense how we think about SWE and the future of blockchains and Web3 today. Um, yeah, and that's, uh, that's yeah. the presentation. So, so just to recap your recap, just so that we have it right. So, so your SWE will transact faster and it will solve the storage issue by allow, by restructuring the way that you do the consensus and the bookkeeping partially yep. and that it's a more elegant programming language so that it's probably easier to understand and harder to make mistakes right so, mm -hmm. so in a way it could be more secure and um and then in in and the, um, the validator structure is quite different, right? So it's not all, you, you can do all kinds of scaling that you couldn't do before, both st structurally and- Yeah, just to touch on that a little bit. What we do is call intra-validator scale, uh, you know, sharding, right? Talk, people yeah. talk about sharding, it's like this group of validator process, this shard, this group of validator process, shard. We're saying the same sets of validator across mm -hmm. the blockchain inside each validator, each validator can become a distributed mm -hmm. system itself, right? So that's how you scale per validator. Yeah. And, and I'll just make a comment as somebody who worked with a lot of programming languages, people at MIT. Um, the, the good thing is that they think big and they think structure and when you get a, the right programming languages team on the right problem, magic happens. But often programming languages don't go as well as planned because they're harder to execute in practice sometimes and so sometimes it's quite theoretical and i think the famous story is lisp was a much more elegant language than c and c is kind of ugly and prone to errors and security but lisp uh, c won over the more theoretically uh, uh elegant uh, uh lisp and their versions of like um also javascript mm -hmm. is messy and but everyone uses it and so mm -hmm. i guess the sort of but, but uh, you know, for me, the LLVM and some of the success that you've had in the past puts you in that 1% of programming languages guys that I think might actually do it. But give us a little bit of sort of uh, for people who are kind of excited about using it, sort of where you are in terms of your deployment. Like w you know, how much of it is done? When is the test net happening? When can we actually kick the tires and see if we yeah. can use it? Yeah. Um, it's functionality complete. Basically, uh, the, the core, the basics are there. Uh, it's very useful, uh, usable right now. A lot of people are building it, right? We're talking about the supposed system as well as the programming language. The programming language is been through, you know, kind of a lot of developments since the Libra days, right? That's the only piece we took with us. Uh, and we just made a better version of it. So, and now the language is being adopted by multiple blockchains. Yeah. Really, and really can I going. Just click on that, yes. just because my understanding would just. So, you guys were building the 
you were the, the blockchain project inside of Facebook for right. six years or so, I think? No, it's only three, oh, three, years. three and a half three years. Three years, okay. Yeah. And for a variety of reasons, Facebook couldn't do the kind of public blockchain that I think was, was the thing that really society wanted. And did they close the project and you left? And then you raised money and rebooted the project with essentially the same team, is that? Uh, no, well, so, so Facebook wanted to do something, but they focus on a particular use case. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're more, Facebook is more a product company, right? Mm -hmm. they, they really want to solve uh, the problem with payments, mm -hmm. right? Think about, the, the, you know, Facebook has a lot of experience of, you know, social network, these kind of product where data transfer is seamless, right? Anything, any action on the internet is seamless until you've gone to payment. Mm -hmm. Right, and then it's all the friction. They want to solve that problem. It's a great problem to solve. Uh, so the blockchain architecture, because we were early uh, learning about it, uh, the, the, the Libra DM blockchain is just like any other blockchain. The structure is basically the same, mm -hmm. right? What we did is construct a better version of it, including the program language. Mm -hmm. uh, so, mm -hmm. so that's, a, you know, that's the, the, the state. Now, the, the project couldn't launch for a variety of reasons, not really technical related. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and that's one reason why I left. But the other reason is my, my co-founder and myself want to take a step further, right? We don't just want to make payment as seamless as everything else that happened on the internet. We want to generalize the problem to any kind of asset. Okay. After all, payment is just money just one type of asset that's pretty basic very easy so uh, and that's really not in the charter of company mm -hmm. like facebook yeah. so for us the reason why we left is because of that right mm -hmm. it's not a place for us to build it uh and also because after three years we kind of figure a few things out mm -hmm. right early on dm when we designed is very basic just like other blockchains we also knew it's not quite the right mm -hmm. end, you know result but we didn't really know how to build it uh, mm -hmm. It's only after a series of research and development, I was like, we got a few things, mm -hmm. you know, in, in our bag. So that's why we left and, mm -hmm. and, and built this. And only after we left, then the company, uh, the project eventually got shut down. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah. And now you have over $300 million and over 80 people or something, right? Uh, we're close, closing 100 people. Wow. Uh, could, be, could be coming next week. Uh, could be coming in a few weeks. Yeah. That's amazing. So, so back to the roadmap. So you're about to deploy your test net that people can, can use? Yeah, we already have DevNet, so a lot of projects already building them. Mm -hmm. There's some really uh, fun small projects already starting to get some traction, it's really, really interesting stuff. Uh, it's a lot of experimentation happening like, with the community, but also some big companies are now like mm -hmm. betting their products mm -hmm. uh, on this. Um, so stay okay. tuned in the next few weeks, you're gonna hear a lot. So definitely it's quite useful, it's quite stable. People are building, experimenting mm -hmm. with it. Testing is all about testing the live, you know, deployment, mm -hmm. you know, run by lots of different companies or individuals. We wanna make sure that's solid. So testing it any day now, then mm -hmm. we're getting to mainnet. When, when is the... Uh, target for uh, Q1 next year. Okay. Uh, we initially were pushing into this year, but we realized given a lot of things going on, it's probably too aggressive. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, looking like Q1 next year. And from a, sort of a Japan perspective, you know, we're in the process right now of doing a whole bunch of reviews of laws and regulations and policies to try to open up Japan. I, if, and we're just in the next few months, I think, having the study groups and figuring things out. I mean, are there any, is there any impact on regulation or how companies should be thinking about the future? Because I think everybody's looking at the current blockchains to yeah. think about what we need to do. I mean, are you going to do anything better, whether it's KYC or, or security and stability? Yeah, I, I, think, I think right now what you're seeing right, um, in terms of uh, crypto products, right, there's two types, right? There's like, who cares about regulation, right? Everything goes, right? Just write some smart contract and at front end, you call it a product. To the ones that say, well, you know, we need uh, entities, right? You re-centralize them, right? You need a company or bank or exchange to handle everything, mm -hmm. you know, back in this black box model, right? Yeah. They handle it KYC, ML checks, right? And then, you know, on both ends. Uh, we think that our, that infrastructure is because the infrastructure is limited. Mm -hmm. We definitely have a very different point of view uh, on how to do that, uh, to be able to separate the, the verification for, from the test station, utilize the blockchain much yeah. better and much one, more flexible. One example is that Japan passed a stable 
stablecoin law, and we're going to have stablecoins next year. But it sounds like people in the ministries are pushing for a permission blockchain, which means only Japanese people and only custodial wallets that you can actually put into smart contracts. And it's sort of not the point, right? This is what I guess you, Libra was like inside of yeah, Facebook, Yeah, so Libra right? is like, right? But, but so can you help us with this, do you think? Oh, yes, absolutely, right? So, you know, from experience of Libra, right? And ultimately, I think that is a move forward, mm -hmm. right? That's better than, you know, the, if you adopt that model, you basically solve the, the inefficiency of the underlying uh, transfer of assets, right? right? It's, it's, it's valuable, don't get me wrong. It's a step forward, but it's not where th what this is about, right? Mm -hmm. If you really want to enrich people's life, enable all these kind of, uh, you know, the change in product, right? Ultimately, you know, you, you want people, Japanese people, any one in the world to benefit from this, you got to go towards this Web3 model where it's more peer-to-peer. Mm -hmm. -peer. That won't work, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. it adds a whole bunch of other frictions. Uh, you basically recentralize the product again at a different endpoint. Uh, we want to, but we understand the need to have the regulations, uh, the AMLs and, and the KYC, as well as any kind of sanction. Mm -hmm. Happy to talk about all those things can be done by leveraging the blockchains, uh, the program language in, in a much better way. And I don't know if other people have questions I can keep asking, and I'm going to go until 10 past, um, even though uh, we said it will stop at 10 or 11. Does anybody have any questions or comments? No? Fascinating. Can, can you elaborate on the KYC okay. process? Yeah. Uh, can you elaborate on the KYC process? Yeah, so, so the very simple model, the mental model is you separate out what does the, the verification or the issue and the issuance of the credential to uh, the verif you know, to, to how you store the credential, right? So let's say today I want to send a payment uh, from a US entity to a Japanese entity, right? So the sender and the receiver both probably have different KYC requirement, different AML requirement. Uh, so let's say this is a fresh account, has never done this before. I will basically send out a request, uh, you, know, you know, a challenge, say, who out there as a service provider can, can, can do the verification, can do the issuance. Uh, I, I am, you know, not, not sentient and I, I pass all these requirements. And there can be a lot of different service providers, me, 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 and it's a marketplace. They compete, right? So somebody come out and say, I'm, you know, I choose this entity because the the most trusted and, and good best pricing. And they do the back office, you know, making sure using your identity information to make sure you satisfy the, these uh, regulation. And then they're the issuer of the, you know, of the certificate, say, good to go. And the test station is not on chain. Okay, uh, and the recip recipient does the same, right, on the same. So, uh, you know, they have to check, you know, probably need a different set of KYC uh, company, you know, that, that's okay by the Japanese government. Uh, and the payment only goes through when the re mm -hmm. recipient pass the, the, mm -hmm. the checks. When you have both the test station on chain, now future transaction doesn't have to go through this mm -hmm. again. Right, and you can also, s and the, the o also the benefit here is you can separate out the issuance of the certificate and the verification mm -hmm. of the, the certificate, right? So you, you, you do away with the control, right? It's not a single company controlling the process. Um, and the, the, you let the market decide. And you're leveraging the blockchain for what it, it's mm -hmm. good at, right? The test stations on chain, it's verified. And you can do other things, right? You can allow the government to have a privilege to mm -hmm. view additional information to challenge things, right? There's a variety of things you can do. Uh, and so you don't have this rigid uh, kind of architecture, right? Just basically have to trust the banks mm -hmm. to handle everything. And you can also have a lot of different payment model, right? Maybe you only need single attestation or you can have to have double attestation on both end, or you can have the payment is pending until the recipient attestation has, you know, comes, right? Uh, or you can have the payment revert back to the sender if after some period of time, you know, expires. So, so this model allow you to 
even extend on other kind of asset, mm -hmm. right? If I'm doing this to transfer an, an object, an NFT that represents a, a different kind of asset, um, our work may, may need to do copyright infringement checks first, right? If I am a brand, I want to digitize my asset. It's a, you know, you, you follow the same model, but a different verifier. Um, so, so this is what we are trying to do, and, and hof you know, hopefully in the coming months we'll actually demonstrate uh, this model uh, working s and successfully. And I think another way to think about it is um, a lot of the government w discussion around this is trying to make the blockchain itself unprivate. But what you can focus on, and this is kind of partially what, what I think Evan's saying, is that you can focus on the transaction. Because right now cash is basically anonymous, but when you try to transfer over $10,000 of cash, you have a lot of paperwork. So you could have the amount, the context in which it's done, and exactly like if it's attached. Because what you want to be able to do is put money inside of smart contracts and things like that. And when you put something inside a smart contract, getting back to the way the Japanese are, I worry, are thinking about um, stablecoin is the smart contract, you can't KYC a smart contract in the abstract because it's actually not a person. But if a person yeah. holds it, then you can do. So I think it, we really should look at the context and the transaction rather than the entire blockchain because then there's a lot of privacy issues yep. with individuals. And when you don't want other countries to be able to see everything that's going on in your country, and so then you default to, oh, let's keep it private. But I think the idea is you want the transportation layer to be universal mm -hmm. and to secure each transaction carefully. And with all of the modern visibility, you can actually catch most um, bad patterns. So yeah. smurfing, which is, you know, you, you, you chop up your transaction into small transactions. Well, you can see those patterns. And I think that another thing about AML and KYC should be, you know, if it's less than a certain amount, it should be anonymous, right? And then right. above a certain amount, it should be some category. And then above another amount, it should be another, um, yeah. for example. And I mean, the whole point is not bake these rules into the infrastructure, that's right? right? Yeah. Because that's the whole point, right? You can program, right? You can define new sets of rules, um, you know, so, yeah, so that's that, the that's problem. That's where you focus on the asset side, yeah. objectifying mm -hmm. that, right. that's, you, you go into the elementary particle, right? Mm -hmm. It's not the person, but the asset. Right. Okay, Any, anybody cool. else? Yeah, I think oh, can you do the mic, Sona, just so that we get it onto the translator? So we're going back to the KYC and the AML side of things. I think historically with the Japanese, you know, about anything to do with PI or personal information, they will not share with foreign entities. Yep. And I think that in order to do so, you know, blockchain and Bitcoin and these things have had a huge bashing in the last few years, given Lazarus and the North Koreans and the geopolitical things that we're experiencing around the world with the Ukraine and Russia and China, et cetera that it makes it more and more difficult, I feel, to get regulations or global regulations passed in terms of blockchain or virtual currencies. Is that, what, what, what's your opinion on that? Well, I mean, you're, you're right, right? It's hard for all these entities of this country to have any kind of like agreement, right? Uh, but that, that's not the point, right? Again, the blockchain is just infrastructure. It's programmable, right? You should be able to define whatever you want. So it's fine for different countries to have slightly, have different regulation. But what, what's the part that's essential to this transferring of, of assets? As long as you have that level of agreement, and you can pretty much do anything you want, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so separating all the, you know, the rules can be expressed, right, as program. That's all. That's the whole point. And and I think it's yeah. important to remember that um, you can both encrypt and also store some of the stuff off chain, right? So I think oh, yeah. I think the architecture that I think we should do in Japan with my number is that there should be entities that will give you a token mm -hmm. that proves that you have a valid my number somewhere, and that token can be attached to your wallet, but that that token doesn't represent anything that's reversible. Right, and that certain entities can go and see that connection given certain process. But what you don't want, which some people are arguing for, is to actually use your my number in the wallet or right. make it publicly visible. And there are very smart ways to tokenize all kinds of approvals. And also, like for instance, we did a, 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 a our credentials for the, our Chiba Institute of Technology um, uh, class completion. So, so the, the school has the person's name and everything like that, but we just write 
to our website the Merkle tree of all of the certificates and all the students' information, but in an encrypted way, so they can be validated against an NFT that's written to the blockchain, but that NFT only contains a way to verify that that person is the person they are, and th that contains no personal information. And it's, it's very easy to construct sort of a relationship between encrypted stuff, off-chain databases, and on-chain databases in a way that you can verify and validate everything without losing personal information. And this kind of architecture, you sort of have to understand the architecture. And the problem is a lot of people coming up with these regulations have very old architectural models of just sort of flat databases and without enough encryption technology. Yeah, yeah. And so I worry that the regulators are going to regulate 30-year-old technology. And then that's, that's something we need to work on. Yeah, I think. yeah, blockchain is actually the worst thing, infrastructure to store personally personal information, because yeah. the history is there, right? Yeah. You yeah. accidentally leak it, you cannot remove it, ever. Yeah, and, and, and that was one question I had about, you were talking about provenance. You're saying the current blockchains aren't good at doing that, but is, isn't that what blockchains do? Does, like when you have artwork, doesn't it show the provenance? Well, it's the provenance of the trans certain transaction, that's it, mm -hmm. right? You know, even before you can create this asset that represents you know, the, the actual assets that, mm -hmm. that in, in the real world, that has to provide that, right? So, I mean, that information has to come from some service provider today, right? Who mm -hmm. does the job of verifying you're the rightful owner of this asset? Mm -hmm. You're the one that can, you know, create and mint this NFT that represent that, right? Yep. And that needs to be, you know, that, again, it's very similar, right? To mm -hmm. some certificate to represent yep. that information is being verified yep. uh, on chain, attached to the asset. Uh, without that, I mean, these NFTs are, you know, does, does mm -hmm. cannot use them to represent yeah. a real world, you know, valuable assets, right? Yeah. Well, I think we're over time, but th thank you, Evan, very well, much. Thank you. And uh, thanks everybody me. for yeah. participating. Really thank enjoy you. it. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.